I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we discuss the latest updates from the war zone as the Ukrainian army pushes Russian troops back in Kherson. We also analyse European energy security as autumn descends across the continent and discuss some of the revealing reactions to tweets by Tesla founder Elon Musk. We are facing a very serious crisis in energy caused by Putin's war in Ukraine. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 4th of October, day 223. And today, I'm joined by Assistant Comment Editor Francis Dernley and the Telegraph's Brussels correspondent, Joe Barnes. I started by asking Joe for the latest updates from the battlefront. Sure, good afternoon, folks. Um, And I will try and fill in uh, for Dom... Nichols' normal uh, military updates as best as I can. Uh, so what we're seeing at the moment, and there's lots and lots of chatter, whether it be Ukrainian sources or pro-Russian sources on Telegram, on Twitter, of basically what is the Russian defensive line on the southern front towards Kherson is collapsing at a, an incredible rate of, of knots. And say what we've heard overnight from President Zelensky is that Ukrainian forces have broken through Russia's defence in the south of the country and are kind of expanding their rapid offensive elsewhere. So the Ukrainians, as per usual, aren't providing a lot of information, if any, on this, because they what they want to maintain is some sort of operational secrecy to basically stop the Russians and keep the Russians guessing and stop them harming their offensives. But so as per a few Russian sources um, that we've been kind of looking at today, the Russians are kind of retreating in mass, and there's multiple reasons for this. So some pro-Russian sources are saying that they're retreating purely because of the lack of rotation in, in the area. So they've not been able to take their forces out and let them have a break. So basically, they're, they're suffering with um, exhaustion because they've been on the front line probably for eight months nearly. So it's and it, you, can't, you can't maintain that sort of fighting posture without... Uh, some sort of break, re-equipment, reconstituting their kind of battle-stricken forces. And so this tactical approach that the Russians also seem to take is that they have been concentrating their forces into the main strongholds inside towns. Uh, so, so you probably look at Kherson and Nova Kakova. But Russians like to base themselves solely in towns, which has allowed the Ukrainians to kind of run around causing chaos uh, amongst the lack of infantry troops uh, that are busy- positioned out of this town. So this is why when the Ukrainians do push forward, we see this, the defensive lines, when they fall, they kind of tumble and it's a really quick offensive. That is literally because Russia, outside of its main strongholds, has very, very little in the way of troops and infantry, especially mobile infantry, so they can defend against these uh, counterattacks. And then what we're looking at as well is the idea that Ukraine has basically been able to deceive and get into the tactical knowledge of what Russia are doing. So one suggestion amongst pro-Russian forces is that Ukrainian units are now painting the Vs and the Z markers on their vehicles, which have become synonymous with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And that's basically what, in order to confuse the Russians... um, which is one actual observer was putting, this would actually mean that Ukraine has quite a high-tech sort of tracking system that allows it to keep tabs on all of its vehicles so it doesn't also confuse uh, its units that are kind of deploying this tactic to deceive the Russians. Um, And then elsewhere, the Russian view is that Ukraine is massing troops for a strike on Melitopol, which is an occupied town in the Zaporizhia region, on the Black Sea, and it's been held by the Russians since the start of the war. It's been held largely there. And what that would enable to do is, and one idea is that the Ukrainians are basically trying to cut off the Russian land bridge into Kherson, which is the first regional capital. It's the first and only major regional capital that Russia has been able to occupy since invading on February 24th. And Essentially, what Russians believe is that 
the Ukrainians are coming in and they're basically trying to encircle it and ensnare it and cut any sort of supply route off. So that's we've seen that kind of tactic recently in, in Limon, where the Ukrainians, instead of making direct attacks, they basically covered off and closed off all but one supply line and resupply route and escape route in, in the end. So we could see the development of that in Kherson, around the city of Kherson. We don't know how long that's going to take. This isn't going to be a complete kind of rapid, really quick tumbling of the Russian lines. Um, some observers are saying that maybe in the next few weeks, but then we've obviously got the unique uh, problem that the war is likely to slow down in the coming weeks because of the weather. Are people going to, are Ukraine and Russia's positions going to be kind of, is it bogged down? Is it going to slow as a result of of the wet weather and basically the the chill that they're suffering. Um, Herson as well is a lot more defended than kind of large amounts of the Kharkiv Oblast. So that's hence the uh, slow uh, progress we'll probably see there. But so what we have seen is President Zelensky announced that a territory had been liberated overnight. We're seeing videos of Ukrainian troops in at least four more territories in the south they all look like they are going towards the aim of cutting off that russian land bridge into herson and then one other thing we've we've just had a briefing with western officials uh, and one interesting point they made is uk ukraine's military was said to be well within the uda loop of russia and in short the uda loop means observe orientate decide and act it's a U.S. tactic um, developed by the U.S. Uh, kind of in, in and around pre-World War II. And what the Western officials briefing has said, this essentially allows Ukraine to wreak havoc within the Russian chain of command because they basically can make decisions and they can make these rapid advances at a rate quicker than how the Russians can, resp how fast the Russians can respond. So actually... What it looks like is now is Ukraine in the south is dictating the operational tempo of the battle. Um, whether this develops into some sort of kind of tr strategic success, which allows Ukraine to actually take back and build a strategic stronghold in the south against further and help further push out the Russians from the area is still to be foreseen. But actually, all is looking well on the kind of military front. And I will stop there. Well, thank you very much, Joe. I do think Dom's probably got some competition now. That was uh, that was very comprehensive. Thank you. Uh, Francis Turnley, can I turn to you? There, there has been a possible raising, I stress possible raising of the stakes um, when talking, when thinking about nuclear tensions. Um, can you take us through quite carefully and precisely what's been Thank you, been David, happening? and good afternoon, everyone. There's reports that a train operated by the secretive nuclear division linked to the 12th main director of the Russian Ministry of Defence has been spotted in central Russia over the weekend, heading towards the front line in Ukraine. There were whispers about this yesterday, um, and we didn't know the full details, but we now have a little bit more information about that. What is the 12th main directorate? Well, essentially, it's responsible for nuclear munitions, storage, maintenance, transport, etc. And I don't want you to think that there's a, a convoy with nuclear weapons travelling to Ukraine. That is not it. It is simply vehicles corresponding to units involved in nuclear munitions are on the move. Now, I think that we need to read this a little bit differently than some analysis. We had some people who've been panicking and saying that this is indicative of, of the nuclear escalation. I think more likely it is an example of Putin showing or attempting to show that his remarks in the speech over the weekend about the nuclear threat are serious um, and that he wants the West to know that this is at least a feasible technical reality. As I've spoken about on the podcast, a lot of questions have been raised previously as to the state of Russian tactical nuclear weapons whether they are actually capable of even being utilised. And I think the fact that we're seeing footage of this on Russian Telegram, of this convoy, is telling 
we're meant to see it. And it's an attempt, as I say, by the Kremlin to show the West that it is, in theory, as I say, not necessarily in reality, capable of some kind of tactical nuclear strike. Now, just one other thing on this is there's been some very interesting analysis in the Washington Post. and Indeed, they've posted a piece uh, by their editorial board online, which I'd recommend listeners to read, where it just talks about not only the 12th Main Directorate and the significance of these tactical nuclear weapons, but it talks also about some of the preparations that are being done, the the war games, uh, the analysis by the Pentagon about what could happen if these weapons were used. But one of the things that the Washington Post really emphasised, and I think they're accurate to do so, is the fact that when and if these weapons were threatened, the tactical ones, not the intercontinental ones, we would know about them. We would see them on the move. It would take many days for them to get into position. That is the crucial time, such as during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when it was similar manoeuvrings that were the crucial time. That is the crucial time when things will really ramp up. Are we seeing that yet? No. We don't think that these trucks are capable of carrying the kind of warheads that we're talking about. But nonetheless, it is something that I think is significant. And even though there's been a lot of scepticism online about them, I think it is important nonetheless to flag this as something that has happened. And as I say, should not be read in terms of the military threat posed by them, but rather their political significance in terms of what the Kremlin are doing with them in a strategic sense. Now, it goes without saying that this nuclear brinkmanship by Vladimir Putin is incredibly risky. I alluded a moment ago to research that's being done, computer simulations at the Pentagon and amongst the intelligence agencies trying to war game what could happen. And we don't know the consequences of those uh, programs, but I think it's been revealing that the former CIA director, General David Petraeus, has suggested that if... Putin were to use some kind of tactical nuclear weapon, that there would be a massive conventional, that is non-nuclear, response, which would likely include the sinking of Russia's Black Sea fleet. So there's that side of it, that's the risk, the military side for Putin. But the other one, of course, is even more significant, which is if he escalates this war in this direction of travel, there is, I don't believe, any reason to think that those people we were speaking about yesterday, those in the Russian elite who are willing to go along with things as, the, as they stand, there's no reason to think that they will be consistent and concrete on that view if real nuclear escalation appears likely. The evidence would suggest that they are not diehards, they are not fully committed to this. And in that situation, I think Putin really does seriously risk his own overthrow, frankly. So, as I say, there's a long, long way to go on this. And I don't want us to read too much into the developments of the last 24 hours. But since these are the conversations that are currently taking place as a consequence, I thought it was right to raise them. Thanks, Francis. Uh, Joe, I know you want to come in a little bit on this and then maybe talk to us about some of the further problems Russia's finding with mo mobilisation. Uh, yeah, um, so again, in this uh briefing with a western official they they were very keen to kind of play down the threat of an intimate in intimate nuclear strike and like so what the what we saw with the train tracks that was um that was given to us by rybar who are kind of a, a pro-russian military blog um that has been giving us quite detailed insight on the russian front lines and the russian goings on via telegram um but what this Western official, and we know that kind of NATO um, and its allies in the US and the UK have stepped up their kind of intelligence looking at where Russia has its nuclear capabilities. And, they, and they, this, this official basically said, look, there are no indicators of further concerning movements when it comes to the, the movement of kind of Russian nuclear weapons. So while the threat is there, they, they are not seeing it as a as a kind of we're not at the state point yet where we're having to issue warnings we're having to look at kind of deploying potential strikes what they're seeing is nothing out of the ordinary of what russia would normally do um even when it's not at war um so 
kind of there's been a lot of kind of obviously speculation about what this train was doing but it looks like as of now western officials aren't particularly concerned about that particular train and the possible movement of nuclear warheads at the moment if I could just come back on that and briefly, I think it's really important as well to stress that even in the worst case scenario, and obviously this, of course this would be the worst case scenario if these weapons were deployed and utilised, that wouldn't be the end of the matter. And indeed there's been some quite interesting analysis published over the weekend that's been talking about the computer simulations uh, at the Pentagon and in American nuclear labs and intelligence agencies that have been trying to model what might happen if these weapons were used and how the United States and the wider West might respond to that. So we've, as I say, reading between the lines, it would appear that from what already has been put out, as we discussed yesterday, that there would be very, very severe consequences indeed. Uh, The kind of talking that was coming out from General Petraeus former CIA director, of course, was that NATO would launch some kind of massive conventional, so non-nuclear military response, which would probably include the sinking of the Russia's Black Sea fleet um, and, of course, a, 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 a other specific targets in Ukraine. That would be an initial response. Now, as I say, that's no, by no means certain, but this is just some of the conversations that are clearly taking place. And indeed, the fact that General Petraeus has put his head above the parapet, as it were, is, I think, revealing of the kind of conversations that are taking place in, uh, in Washington. But I, I stress again that there's a, there seems to be this sort of narrative that if Putin were to use these weapons, that it would all go his own way, that then immediately, you know, the West would, would, would have called his bluff and been shown, um, shown up, as it were. But actually, just think about the huge risks for Putin if he were to do this, not only in terms of the Western response, but the, the risks of radiation and the damage that would do for his own army if things went wrong, the... Uh, very nature of him using these weapons would inevitably put his own personal survival at risk, not only from the from the West, but indeed from his own people around him. I mean, as I was questioning yesterday from some of the intelligence, uh, the uh, it would be suggestive, I would argue, that the whilst the Russian elite currently support Putin and are willing to go along with this, whilst Putin's position seems unassailable. There's no reason, based on the intelligence that we've been receiving, to think that that is absolutely concrete and ideologically locked in. So I think for all of this, it is worth saying that actually I would argue that we are still a very, very long way from this escalating to the to the crisis point as i was saying earlier but even if it does i don't think that's something that putin would arguably welcome i think it puts him even more at risk and in a position that ultimately can only lead one way and that is disaster for russia well thank you very much uh, for that francis let's move on i think we need to talk about mobilization briefly before we'll talk about elon musk being flamed to a well done chris by ukrainians on twitter yesterday um so joe there's been some updates on uh, russia's mobilization drive can you take us through them so yeah as as we know the um kremlin and vladimir putin signed this decree to kind of call up conscript at least 300,000 russians to fight in ukraine and say some of the chaos that we've seen has kind of been symptomatic with the failures on the battlefield demonstrated by the Russian military. Um, So kind of one of the latest updates is that Russian lawyers are now working flat out to offer advice to those being sent to fight in Ukraine. The lawyers and civil society groups say they have just been like absolutely swamped with requests for help um, as kind of this effort to mobilise all these troops kind of goes on. We've seen hundreds of thousands flee to countries like Kazakhstan, Georgia and Finland and say many more in Russia kind of have gone into hiding um, or saying that their religion is going to block them from fighting and basically doing anything they can. So I think we reported last week that there were videos floating around on TikTok and Telegram of young Russians breaking or asking their fr- friends to break their arms and their legs in the hope that they won't be conscripted because they literally cannot fight. 
Um, and then other things that we've been observing in, in the last few days is basically the morale levels amongst the Russian soldiers is, is not going to help. We've seen uh, swarms of kind of kit that these Russian conscripts have been asked to find have appeared on the Russian version of eBay at inflated prices, which hints that commanders who probably knew about the mobilization coming had basically stolen a lot of the stocks and the supplies and now are selling it on for their their own their own kind of gains, which is something that we've kind of seen uh, corruption is being kind of systematic inside the Russian military. Uh, another interesting point that I think is worth pointing out, it would it would seem that the military grade kit is not the only issue for new conscripts. We're coming in into a time with the winter time, uh, the weather in Ukraine can get bitterly, bitterly, bitterly cold, as well as bitterly hot during the summer. Um, and we've seen a lot of v videos of Russians lighting fires in fields, um, which, A, makes them uh, kind of puts them at risk of being spotted by drones, Ukrainian intelligence. But basically, that is, at the moment, Ukraine is going to around minus five degrees at night. So if these Russians are not being given the right kind of cold weather kit, whether it be coats, sleeping bags, proper tents and proper heaters and other kit like that, that's not going to help with the morale of these troops being sent to the... Um, to the front and also what's being observed by kind of western intelligence is that they are still unsure of what the purpose is for the calling up 300,000 men to fight in Ukraine is it to simply plug the kind of battle stricken units and kind of fill in where we've seen kind of massive losses of russian lives or, or just injured being having to be sent back because they can no longer fight or are they there for actually developing brand new kind of military units that can go and fight alongside? But what we've got to remember is some of these people are being sent to the front line with only two weeks of training. So this means you're going to probably see a lot of new Russian units pop up and they're just not going to have the tactical and the defensive nous and the fighting combat knowledge that is being displayed by the Ukrainians. So... While this kind of mobilisation is happening, is actually still serious questions over the fact of whether will it actually have a difference uh, or make a difference, sorry, on the front line. And, and basically the experts are saying, no, it won't. And it actually is probably going to make Russia's job harder because they are basically sending men as cannon fodder rather than highly trained soldiers to try and complete their objectives. Well, thank you very much for that, Joe. We'll come on. You've raised a couple of things there. We'll come on to talking about uh, winter later, I think, when we talk about energy. Uh, let's move on to Elon Musk. So Elon Musk, the tech billionaire, has found himself embroiled in a bit of a row with, uh, well, most Ukrainians on Twitter that we can see uh, after suggesting his own controversial peace plan to end the war. Um, I don't want to talk about him just because, you know, he's not, he's not inherently worth talking about. But I thought the reaction to his plan... Um, showed us quite a few, was quite revealing, showed us quite a few interesting things. I mean, one thing I've just been said, some Ukrainians have been uh, um, fundraising to buy to, for a new history book for Mr. Musk, and they've already raised 60,000 US dollars. So it shows you just the strength of feeling uh, against what he was proposing. So Francis, can you, can you take us through what uh, Musk was speaking about, uh, what the reaction was, and why this is interesting? What, what does this reveal? Sure. Well, $60,000, he is the wealthiest man in the world. So I'm sure he would be able to afford said history book. But um, I digress. Yes. So it's ironic, actually, that Elon Musk has come under fire in this way, because until now, he's been very, very popular in Ukraine for reasons we've talked about in the past on the podcast, which is his Starlink program, which has uh, effectively a satellite that provide uh, low bandwidth Wi-Fi in places that lose access. And he's essentially turned those on over Ukraine that have enabled us to get valuable intelligence and information out from those Yes, besieged in Mariupol, for instance. Um, but as you say, he has very much come under under fire today uh, with regard to his statements posted overnight on Twitter. So to summarise, essentially what he did is propose UN supervised elections in the four occupied regions that Moscow last week moved to annex. Um, he was essentially, I think, trying to propose a solution to 
the problem of one of these narratives in the West, which we touched on yesterday, which is that these areas have large Russian speaking populations and thereby the belief being, I'm not saying I believe this, but the belief being that they are therefore there are large portions of this population that are actually sympathetic to Russia and thereby if there were referendums that were legitimate, I think he is trying to say that there may be some that would lean towards Russia and others that may not. But this would, if the UN would get involved, might offer some kind of solution to the present crisis. Now, you can imagine the kind of reaction that has come in. Uh, you mentioned President Zelensky. He proposed um, a, a, a question to his followers, which is, which Elon Musk do you like more one who supports Ukraine or one who supports Russia. Uh, a senior advisor to Mr. Zelensky said, will 100,000 one, 100, dead in Mariupol vote or those who went through concentration cramps? Elon Musk, you create rockets and dream of colonising Mars. Russia creates mobile crematoria and dreams of Ukrainians disappearing as a nation. It is not a voting issue. Lithuania's president has also intervened, saying, Dear Elon Musk, when someone tries to steal the wheels of your Tesla, it doesn't make them legal owner of the car or of the wheels, even though they claim both voted in favour of it. Just saying. Now, Elon Musk, not one to shy away from controversy, then waded in again and said as a response, let's try this then. The will of the people who live in the Donbass and Crimea should decide whether they, they're part of Russia or Ukraine. So again, trying to posit this idea that if a referendum were possible that were internationally legitimate, whether it would be an advisable strategy. And again, he came under very, very similar criticism. Now, it's been interesting, I think, the most revealing aspect of this is the Kremlin's reaction. They have said today that they see this as a positive step by the Tesla founder of this possible peace deal. Now, what does that tell us? Well, I think it's very, very clear that they are seeking an off-ramp to this conflict. They have essentially accepted that they will not take the entirety of Ukraine. That is a huge defeat already compared to their initial objective, which was the seizure of at least half the country and the capitulation of the second half. So already, I think it's if you can imagine the, the reverse situation here, if the war was going well from a Russian perspective, then it, there's no motivation whatsoever they would have to be supportive of Elon Musk's remarks. So that's my first point. But nonetheless, I think the other reason that's significant here is Musk's thinking is emblematic of a common thread of thinking in the West, which is why I think it's gained such traction, is that he is in many ways indicative of, of a certain viewpoint that's becoming, I would not say necessarily increasingly common, but nonetheless is more vocally being spoken about, indeed by Dominic Cummings as well, former Chief of Staff Boris Johnson, prior to the war, who has also waded in with supportive remarks towards Trusk, Trusk uh, Musk. And their thinking is that essentially Ukraine can never prevail. We have to take Putin's nuclear threats seriously. Uh, the cost of the sanctions and the energy war are becoming so severe that it's not really possible to, to keep up the effort in the long term. And I think it's important just to, 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 to make the point here that there is some misunderstandings in the remarks here by Musk, which is that he, in supporting his argument, tried to make the point that if Russia were to fully mobilise, then they would be in an incredibly strong position and would eventually defeat Ukraine. But as we've spoken about at length on this podcast, there is no reason to think that a general mobilisation will actually be something that will uh, lead to a profound shift of the strategic military situation on the ground. So I think this is all built on a somewhat of a fel false premise that the war is unwinnable militarily. So I think that's why, as I say, it's it's caused such a an earthquake of reaction. This is actually it speaks to, I think, an anxiety an anxiety amongst the Ukrainians that this is a common thread of thinking amongst the West and also an anxiety amongst the Russians too, of course, that this way of thinking, this off-ramp that is being offered, will be completely dismissed out of hand 
making their very difficult situation even worse, which is why they have vocalised their support of it. We've got a piece in the paper today. It'll be online tonight in the paper tomorrow by Sir Michael Fallon, who is the former Secretary of State for Defence here in Britain, 2014 to 2017. He knows his onions, as Don would say, and he is going to argue essentially against this, this, this idea put forward by Musk and saying that there is no sustainable peace plan that doesn't involve a total ejection of Putin from Ukraine for the simple fact that a frozen conflict is a myth, that whatever happens, Putin will, if the war was paused, would again return at some point and would seek to continue once his hand was stronger, that he has to be defeated decisively and in such a manner that it means that there is no peace deal that is put in that is possible. As I say, I don't think, to your point, David, that we should necessarily see Musk as as uh, this all-powerful figure who's somehow shaping the terms of the debate. But I do think that we should read a lot into the reaction from both sides. Thank you very much, Francis. Yeah, I, when I first saw it, I sort of didn't want to talk about it at all, really, because there's yeah, there's no inherent reason why we should care what Elon Musk thinks, thinks about anything, really. But I thought, as we said, I think the, the reaction was very interesting and very revealing. And I think you've brought that out very nicely. Thank you. Joe, I know you wanted to come in on this and you had a few ideas as well. Yeah. So the um, the first is, is that, as Francis summed up beautifully there, is Elon Musk has these ideas, but they seem to now contrast with a lot of what the West and Western governments are saying in public, that it's Ukraine, ultimately Ukraine's government, its decision um, about how and when a the conflict comes to an end. And actually what we've seen today is Vladimir Zelensky, Ukraine's president, has signed a decree basically refusing any negotiations with his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin. So, and we've, we've been seeing this in recent weeks, but basically Ukraine has said it's impossible to go to the negotiating table with Vladimir Putin because they basically see him as a complete lunatic um, who doesn't want uh, to kind of follow and will he uphold any sort of peace deal that's broken, brokered in the future. Um, and you can actually look at precedents on this. Um, so we had the Minsk deals that were brokered uh, after 2014, um, which basically did freeze the conflict. They left uh, the Septis regions in Donetsk and Luhansk kind of there, uh, floating around. The question was left open and it basically allowed... Vladimir Putin over the years to build up a stronger and stronger, stronger foothold in those areas, allowed him to reinforce troops and then essentially allowed for him to launch this invasion on February 24th. So the idea that Ukraine would again entertain anything but kind of a full military victory, um, anything that would leave the conflict in a standstill, allowing Russia to reconstitute its forces, is just something that we wouldn't, we we just wouldn't see at all. Um, and I think Vladimir Zelensky putting this into a presidential decree, saying, "Look, we're not going to negotiate. We're effectively we are going to win this war and win back uh, the entirety of Ukraine, and that includes Crimea." Um, is this exactly what we're going to see? And I think their battlefield victories in Kharkiv, in Kherson, is only giving the Ukrainians more kind of feeling that they can actually win this on the battlefield rather than resorting to kind of a messy peace deal that will probably do nothing for the Ukrainian state and nothing for security guarantees moving forward because we've been there, we've done that, and... We once again, we had Vladimir Putin launch an invasion into Ukraine, despite there being some sort of peace agenda on the table in the form of the Minsk agreements. Thanks, Joe. And thanks, Francis. Can we move on and talk a little bit about energy, in particular, uh, thinking of the current uh, current updates to do with energy in, in the light of an approaching winter? Francis, can you take us through what you've been reading? Certainly. Well, there's going to be an interesting dinner tonight between French and German leaders in the context of there's a growing fear that Germany will use its economic muscle if that's the right way of phrasing it, to outbid the rest of the EU for gas supplies this winter. So Germany is 
coming under increasing pressure to contribute to the EU's bailout fund, which comes on top of its own national 22 billion euro energy support package for consumers and businesses in the country. Now, this has angered certain other countries, Italy and France among them, who are accusing Germany of using its own national wealth and budgetary surplus to outbid other countries in the battle for gas. Not a great look. So, but the positive thing here is that there is actually a discussion, as I say, taking place tonight in an attempt to resolve this rather than it being something that's being fought between uh, diplomats um, and on the market stall. So there's that is going on. And I think even though it sounds negative at the moment, I think the fact they are meeting is, is indicative of a, of a positive trajectory. And I'm sure Joe may have a few thoughts on this. Um, this also comes in the background of a statement by the US Treasury, which has estimated that the G7's plan to cap the price of Russian oil exports could yield $160 billion in annual savings for the 50 largest emerging markets. This is the scheme that I've spoken about in the past, which is an attempt to stop Russia from profiting from the higher price of Russian oil even though they're selling less of it, that because obviously the, 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 there is fewer of the resource, the price goes up. They're trying to prevent that in the G7. And as a consequence of this analysis, they're trying to push support for this pri planned uh, price cap. I think they will be successful, but we don't yet have complete approval yet. They've approved it in principle, but it's not yet um, to kick in. I think it's due to start around December time, all being well. But all of this comes back, I think, to the central question, David, which you just posed there, which is about this unknown quantity being the severity of winter. If winter is mild, then a lot of this speculation, a lot of this talk will actually fade, not into irrelevance, will be, but will not be as significant as perhaps has been expected prior to now. But if winter is severe, and of course, Russia on it throughout its history has relied on general winter as a sort of parochially known. It did so in 1812, it did so in 1941. Then a severe winter would be catastrophic potentially on two fronts. The first being energy, although, as I say, in my own view, I think that the markets are reacting and adapting to that. And I think with the energy cap, that things will no, be nowhere near as severe as initially feared. But that, as I say, is not certain, so it's important to make the point that that may not be the case. But they would also be bad for the military situation on the ground, because, as I say, the military advances that Ukraine have been making up until now are broadly based on favourable weather conditions, as well as their own, obviously, um, uh, bravery and the, the skills that they've developed, the strategy, everything else. But the weather has been favourable towards advancing. If we have a severe winter, as I say, the weather, the winter will be bad for um, uh, from the military perspective, but it'll also be bad from the energy perspective. A moderate winter will favour both fronts. And we obviously are not in a position yet to know that. But early signs, early signs are that we may be facing quite a challenging winter. I was looking at some weather reports earlier and there are suggestions that it could be a cold winter. So as I say, not something necessarily to be thinking about too anxiously, but something I think to be sensitive to as the seasons change. Joe, do you want to come in on this as well? Yeah, so first I'll, I'll speak about the, the weather element of it. And I was speaking to a NATO diplomat the other day, um, and they were saying that the challenge with the having a cold winter this year is actually they can sustain themselves. Uh, Europe now uh, can sustain themselves through a winter because they've been made to build up their kind of stocks and supplies and storage capacity um, ahead of the winter. But what you do is if you have a cold winter, you suddenly start running that low, those, that storage capacity. You start really depleting your storage and stored gas and stored other energy, fossil fuels, so what we would see is potentially not this winter, but moving forward to next winter, that would be the real challenge. So I think what we have to emphasize here is this isn't just a one-off. This is the movement away 
and the diversification away from Russian fossil fuels is going to be a kind of a, a huge, huge challenge that is going to kind of plague Europe for win many winters to come. And actually, most people are confident that they can circumnavigate the challenges of this winter, but next winter, are they going to be through the spring and the summer able to rebuild their supplies and get them ready for next winter questions are out on that so that's one thing that we should be looking at so a cold winter is only going to make next winter worse and then to flick back to this kind of eu row and the brewing dispute over germany's 200 billion euro kind of energy bailout plan is this is only kind of enhanced ill feelings amongst the southern countries that were so repressed during the financial crisis of 2008 and onwards when they were basically Germany told them that they should pay for their kind of poor finances through austerity so this is now the southern governments of the EU's opportunity to kind of get back at Germany and say look you are now in the mess you should not kind of get off the hook and be able to kind of bring instability with your kind of vast public finances to the EU single market. So this is what we're going to see is the likes of France uh, are on board with this, Italy are on board with this, you guess Spain and Portugal and Greece will come on board with this. The idea that instead of putting 200 billion euros down for just Germany, you, it, we should look at, the EU should look at building some sort of Covid style uh, bailout system that they came up with which involved the EU borrowing 750 billion euros basically underwritten by the likes of France and Germany's economy um, to fund new loans and grants to basically help the economy recover from Covid and this is something that the EU and those southern countries and potentially France would like to see used for going forward on energy and gas um so i think we're going to see we're, we're 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 after this i'll be flying to prague tomorrow and there's going to be a meeting of the european political community uh, which is 44 countries including britain on and it's the main topic it's going to be russia ukraine and energy and migration as well is going to feature in that but that's probably not for us but then after that eu leaders are going to meet and they're going to meet in an informal setting so there's going to be no formal decisions but this will actually enable them to have a really frank discussion and I can see many of them calling out Germany and basically accusing the Germans of being slightly greedy using its own vast public finances to defend and protect itself when actually what they should be looking to do is use that 200 billion to build a new system a new publicly funded system which underwrites the whole of the EU, where the EU borrows vast sums of money to pay for new gas supplies, new energy supplies, and basically new protections to weather future energy crises going forward. So it's a great row that we will see, and it will remind us of the row that we saw over the EU's COVID system, the COVID bailout system, and it is only fueled by the southern governments that were kind of subject to troikas and told to enforce austerity in exchange for German bailouts during the financial crisis. Now it's their chance to get their own back. If I could just jump in there, I'd echo everything that Joe has just said. And I think this underlines a critical point, which has to be stressed again and again, which is that we are in this position, thanks to deliberate policies by Western leaders of their own making over a generation or more. I'm not just talking about Germany and Nord Stream 1 and 2. I'm talking about this lack of priority given to energy security, nuclear energy and, and the like, which has led us and got us to this point where arguably you could say it's the major factor that Putin has had in his favour, aside from the threat of nuclear weapons to get what he wants. This brokerage has been incredibly significant. And I think, as Joe was saying, it's going to be a long term challenge to reclaw back the energy geopolitical weight that was sacrificed in the years after the Cold War. Not only was it sacrificed to Russia, but it was sacrificed to the Middle East as well. 
that also has worrying ramifications when one looks at how unstable things are in that region. This was a policy that was deliberately followed through at the expense, I would argue, of, of really thinking in a long-term, historically sensitive way. It was an arrogance, and it's one that we're now going to have to, to rectify, but it will be very, very expensive and could come at more than just a financial cost, but, but arguably, well, arguably already has, um, uh, not, uh, but a military and a moral one. Well, thank you very much, Joe and Francis, for all of your thoughts and your time today. Can I just ask you for your final thoughts? What will you be looking at? What will you be thinking about uh, over the next few days? I was just struck as we were talking about the nuclear question that we're talking still, and rightly so, I think, because it's important to do so, in terms of logical steps, politics being one thing happens, there's a response, another thing happens, there's a response to that, and so on and so forth. But we forget just how much accidents, uncertain events can totally reshape not only a battlefield, but the way in which we approach the next phase of any conflict or any political crisis. And I think we need to remember that as we enter this talk about nuclear brinkmanship. The reality is that we've escaped, and I use that word escaped, underlined, nuclear escalation and potentially even the use of nuclear weapons twice very, very seriously in the 20th century. Not only with the Cuban Missile Crisis, when one boat had the order, the the, the permission to fire, and indeed the captain sought to do so, but once they were in the position to do so, uh, in terms of the geopolitical situation, but also the geographical position that they were in, they were no longer able to fire on the American fleet. So one man put a stop to that. In 1983, again, one man manning the Russian nuclear station that was receiving reports, which proved to be inaccurate, of a preemptive strike on Russia was given permission to launch some kind of strike. Again, we escaped that narrowly through luck and through humans being humans and making a rational calculation with the facts as they appeared in front of them. We live in an age now where a lot more of these kind of decisions are automated. So when we talk about brinkmanship and when we talk about the nuclear threat, yes, we should be thinking about it in terms of action, reaction. But remember that there is a huge risk related to all of this. And that is why what Putin is doing is so unbelievably reckless and must be met with the sternest possible resistance from the West that it can possibly conjure. Thank you, Francis. Uh, Joe, would you like the very, very final thoughts? Yes. um, So kind of breaking on Twitter while we've been speaking is... um, Ben Wallace has joined the uh, North Atlantic Fellows Organisation, those funny, amusing dogs, uh, Shibu dogs, that have uh, been trolling Russian officials and diplomats and politicians on Twitter. Um, he has been given a his own sort of meme. But then uh, more seriously, I would look at and kind of urge people to look at what's happening in northeastern Kherson uh, going forward, and it could actually be not just kind of in the next few days it's in the next few hours but uh, Rybar in its kind of 3 p.m moscow update has kind of published this map which suggests the whole of the northeastern kind of flank on the herson front is now collapsing and there's kind of a mass russian evacuation and withdrawal while ukraine pushes forward so i think we should really look closely at what's happening in herson and in the next few weeks will we get to a situation kind of before weather prevents this before the winter prevents this of ukraine getting into a position where it can encircle uh some pretty serious uh stronghold perhaps in herson city or leave russian troops with their backs basically stuck against the dnipro uh with nowhere to go um as kind of winter stops the war as such um so i think really let's have a look at herson and will we start to see the ukrainians sort of make some quite significant gains there um, and then basically put themselves in a position where they can consolidate their 
kind of gains over the winter months and then when the weather kind of the grounds freeze over again they will be able to go in and start kind of making more gains and keeping Russia on the back foot going forward. Thank you very much, Joan Francis. Just one observation from me, Joe. We've, we've talked a little bit about uh, winter weather ahead. And I was struck by what you were saying earlier today about how the supplies that Russian troops are receiving, you know, we're not confident that many are receiving proper supplies for the winter heaters, uh, winter appropriate clothing or, or anything like that. So I wonder, I wonder whether Francis would like to just quickly comment on this. But the idea that General Winter, uh, often, often an ally of Russian forces in the Second World War and in the War of 1812, might actually prove proved to be fighting for the other side this time round. Quite possibly. And as I say, to your point, David, previously, Russia has relied on General Winter very, very heavily. I think it's a very strong argument to be made that Moscow would have fallen in 1941, which would have precipitated the entire collapse of the Soviet Union, were it not for the weather hitting in when it did. But to your point, the dire state of the Russian army in terms of its equipment and winter preparation, is such that if there is a bad winter, for all of the talk that I was saying earlier on about the consequences of that from the Western perspective and the Ukrainian perspective, there is another side to that, which is that it could well be that Russia really, really, this is the straw that breaks the the camel's back, as it were, and the Russian army really faces such severe privations that ultimately it precipitates some kind of broader collapse but as i say we don't know and as 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 ever in history weather is the great unknown quantity that's very true yeah i mean i just i just remember being in butcher and seeing what in 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 the school there and seeing the uh the ukrainian basically local society coming together to to make things all sorts of different things whether it was cam um camouflage um cover for for tanks or 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 um sleeping bags that sort of thing for 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 the army and i can you know i I do imagine that now they're probably all thinking about winter and making sure that at least their troops are are kept warm but yes well thank you very much francis and joe thank you for your time today we've gone, gone on for quite a long time so thank you for staying with us Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk slash audio. And sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message and we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, And today on Twitter, Claire Hubble.